community. Yeah, it's not much here, big title on its own. Um, so um, perhaps to help us frame the session, uh, since when we talk about geopolitics, it's basically everything under the sun. So let me just start off with a little bit of background. Now, we're looking at a world order as we know it is, some of the thing is changing or something is worth like realigning. And against the backdrop of a raging pandemic that has further exacerbated global inequity, we are also witnessing the US-China trade war further escalating into an arms race in South China Sea. And this is pulling the EU nations and even ASEAN nations into a political, geopolitical vortex. The return of the Taliban after 20 years. And what Will this have uh, the implication of this towards Muslim majority countries, particularly on issues such as democracy, gender equality, etc.? At the same time, the Middle East is still facing such instability, where uh, the Syrian war is entering, entering its tenth year, while it is slowing down. But the social, political, and economic implications will be felt beyond the region for decades to come. And a young budding uh, democratic country, Tunisia, is also in danger of slipping away from democracy with the recent power grab. And the jury is still out there with that. So within this, and then you have Pew Research Center um, polling that shows that the Muslim population makes up 24% of the world and is expected to grow. So you see Muslims are sizable in number. But we are at the same time not homogenous. We are very diversified. But also within this diversity, we also have such strength, which we can see from the $140 billion halal industry and the fast growing economic, sorry, the fast growing Islamic banking and finance sector that continues to grow. So, with, our, with that economic background as well, um, where is our place when it comes to geopolitics? Where is our voice? Is there such a thing as a Muslim world? When, when we're looking at the global security and humanitarian challenges today, from as uh, Dr. Osman Bakr has already mentioned, climate change, the humanitarian refugee Muslim world crisis, where has our policy been on that? And within this, we are also from Southeast Asia, a country that's rarely referred to when it comes to uh, Muslims or Numa. And to actually try and discuss this and to explore these issues uh, from the angle of Southeast Asia, we have a distinguished uh, uh, panelist today. We have three um, gentlemen um, who are successful in their own right and um, have been contributing to uh, Malaysia and um, Southeast Asia from their work. Um, let me introduce you to our first speaker. I'm sorry, or um, can can you hear me? I heard that my voice is not clear. Is it clear now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So our first speaker is um, perhaps all of you know as well. Is associate professor Dr. Muhammad Azam Muhammad Adil. He is the CEO and co principal fellow of the Institute of uh, International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies in Malaysia. Um, he holds a degree in Sharia from the University of Malaya and also obtained a master's in LLM and PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Um, he's been working both in the teaching and in the academic year here, as well as also sharing his expertise in the realm of Islamic banking and finance, such as being the independent director of JMB Islamic Bank Berhad previously, as well as previously also the chairman of the CIMB Group uh, Sharia Committee. He has written extensively in issues pertaining to Islam, Muslims in Malaysia and in Southeast Asia. I think the most recent publication that he has done is Domestic Violence as a Ground for Distribution of Marriage, Pandangan Sharia Bagi Kuman Mati. So without further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to um, Dr. Muhammad Kilagan. Okay, thank you very much, Altaf. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, the other panelists, uh, Tunku Zain, Dr. Khairuddin Aljunid, ladies and gentlemen who are joining us. I think uh, we have heard uh, Prof. Osman Bakas uh, this morning with regard to the keynote, and I think lots of important points that we can share. 
I think in our session, we will be concentrating uh, or focus on the South uh, East Asian Muslims. Uh, I mean, if I can say contribution or what we call it, whether we would be more in the front, forefront in the positioning ourselves and knowing Southeast Asia or what we call uh, in the other day or those days, what we call it Nusantara. I think we are now picking up that word of Nusantara or we call it the Malay world uh, right now. Uh, known as today that comprises of Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, the Southern Philippines and Southern Thailand. So as, as far as Muslims are concerned, they are represents about 42% of this total population in Southeast Asia and the total number uh, achieved to 275 million. And most of this came from these three dominant Muslim countries, namely Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei. Of course, uh, Singapore, where Dr. Haruddin Aljuni is now working there, where they have about 15% of the Muslim population whereas in, in, in Malaysia, about 60%, and Indonesia and Brunei, close to 90%. As far as the point that I would like to raise pertaining to whether we should have a forefront on this, I have three key important points that I would like to share. One is the location of Southeast Asia at an Islamic peripheral, uh, in contrast to the Muslim heartland of the Arab countries in the Middle East. In Islam, as we know, that there is no differentiation or division between center of, on, or periphery, but this concept of periphery is beneficial in describing the geographic and ethnographic difference between the heartland Arab countries and other Muslim countries. Muslim peripheral countries like Turkey, Malaysia and Indonesia have a unique position that disturbs themselves from the heartland Arab countries where Islam is often culturally inseparable with Arabism. So the peripheral position also disturbs these countries from the ongoing geopolitics, conflict and violence currently plaguing the region. So I think this is, this is quite important. So due to this distance uh, of the Middle East and Southeast Asia, uh, I think the Southeast Asian Muslim countries are more culturally diverse, uh, sorry, or are more culturally diverse, inclusive, and open. And if we were to see from the historical perspective how this Islamization took place in Southeast Asia, it was described as a peaceful penetration as opposed to via conquest or violence. I think perhaps. I think Dr. Haruddin Aljunit, you may add more on this, but I think the notion or the influence of the Sufism and also Tariqah and also the, what we call it, the, uh, the, the adab of the Malays, especially, uh, we, 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 are, we are more polite in that sense, I think, so we don't like uh, violence, etc. So that would be something that I would discuss later, how this takes place in Southeast Asia, in particular in Malaysia. My second point on this is, uh, I think, I believe Dr. Khairuddin will talk on this uh, more, but I just would like to touch a bit on this cosmolo cosmopolitanism in nature, where I refer a bit of this work by Dr. Khairuddin. Eh? As the word cosmopolitan, uh, I think, uh, derived from the Greek word cosmopolitan, where it means uh, citizen of the world has been used to describe a wide variety of important views in moral and social political philosophy. The peripheral position of Southeast Asia enables it experience and apply Islam within a more culturally diverse context. And this is quite important, which I have been repeating many, many times, and I will be repeating that in my next presentation. Input and values gained through multicultural, exchanges enable Southeast Asian Muslim countries to focus on the higher principles of Islam, what we call it Makassi Sharia, rather than other associated cultural or political baggage, which I think we are, I mean, we are very, very much ahead of this. Much of the thinking and practices of Muslims in Southeast Asia today and throughout history is guided by this framework of Makassi Sharia, where the well-being and public interest of the larger society 
must be preserved for Muslims to coexist amicably with each other and with other communities, even though many are, many are often unconscious of it. As a result, in Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei, the Islamization process is often implemented through ventures in the areas of education, economics and public space, uh, thereby largely counteracting the more extreme Islamist agenda. So we left behind, we leave behind all this controversy. There are, I mean, the, I mean, plan for it to implement fully Islamic law in the sense of Islamic criminal law, who do law kicks off, for example, but that's not the place that I think in the mainstream. Hence, Indonesia and Malaysia have been largely successful in combating terrorism. In modern times, Muslims in Southeast Asia provided the Middle East with a model of compatibility between Islam, democracy and development. So that does not take place in most of the Middle East countries, especially in the, in the Gulf states. Muslims in Southeast Asia also provide a model of religious tolerance and pluralism. Here, multicultural and pluralized sites flourish, such as in Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, and Jakarta, among many others. My third point would be on the robust young population. The Muslim population of Southeast Asia has a useful profile due to high birth rates and state policies of encouraging marriage. The Southeast Asian Muslim youth has been by and large globalized in its outlook plugging into global popular cultures and consumption patterns and appropriating ideas from Muslim scholars in many parts of the world to address its own challenges and queries. The globalized Muslim youth manifests an innate tendency in securitizing different influences that emanate from the West, the Middle East and Asia to oppress unique rendering of Islam that are colored by local cultures. And this we can see in a few examples. Like in the recent 2021 bombing in Gaza, Malaysia and Indonesian citizens plays a vital role in nebaging Israel's online reputation through social media and also help galvanize global support for the Palestinian cause. We are much ahead of this from other Muslim countries. A popular hashtag that Malaysians have made famous in what we call it the Israel Koyak slogan. And these youths are not afraid of adopting new technologies, methods, cultures, and ideas. And these form pattern uh, ingredients to become global Muslim leaders. Now I move to uh, the position of Malaysia. Uh, why, how can we become and, and examples and how we can have these challenges, the facing the Muslim world uh, in, in this part of, of, of the world, especially we go into Malaysia. But before I go and answer to the uh, issue or uh, pertaining to, for example, the right-wing ethno-religious extremism, for me, it is important to note that Malaysia remains of one of the most peaceful countries for example, Malaysia ranked 23rd in the 2021 Global Peace Index. Right-wing extremism has yet escalated to that of the USA or India. While ethnic relations in Malaysia have not always been optimal with the presence of several social deficits, of course, there got a number of examples there, Malaysia remains relatively peaceful and in harmony. The ethnic relations in the country can be described as stable tensions, which has been popularized by Professor Ulung Shamsul Amri. The situation in Malaysia is unlikely to accumulate into violence aside from the brief racial riot of May 1969. For example, after that, we have Reformasi 1998, Bersay 1.0 until 4.0. It did not escalate into a coup d'etat. Uh, and these give examples. Uh, we will make a lot of noise, we'll be sharing lots of things in the tutor, but we will not take it on the street, and perhaps due to this factor. Such stability is due to the consistent economic growth, high social mobility, equal access to education, public services, reliable healthcare providers, and preservation of human rights. But perhaps there are certain elements or certain things, I think, uh, if I can say, experience of not a really good experience 
uh, pertaining to what the points I mentioned during this COVID-19 and also lockdown, perhaps it has go beyond uh, the original planning. But I think, uh, nevertheless, we are still under the very good condition. Uh, my other points would be Malaysia remains an exemplary, exemplary model of Muslim country. Although many can be improved, Malaysia has all the above benefits of being a Southeast Asian Muslim country that is periphery, cosmopolitanism, robust young population, but has an added unique advantage of what we call it promoting unity in diversity, which is essential to be a global Muslim leader which requires interaction with diverse cultures and civilization. In Malaysia, diversity is celebrated. <clears throat> its nation building model is based on acculturation, not assimilation. And this is basically I emphasize in the Quran and in the popular verse, uh, verse 13 of Surah Al-Hujurat, where cultural diversity is for the purpose of learning from each other in the sight of God IT is more important than gender, ethnic, and cultural background. And this also has been re-emphasized in the other verse, uh, in, uh, in verse 70 in Surah Al-Isra, where all humans are created with dignity. In the assimilation model, where uh, took place or taking place, namely in Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines, national identity is built based on uniformity with one national language and identity. The assimilation process demands a mandatory removal of any origin and forces the minority to assimilate with most indigenous social culture and structure. On the contrary, the accommodation process requires a different means of recognition to accept any city's identity. Malaysia is a state that intentionally promotes diversity as an identity. The multi-ethnic society can cohesively live and work together, although they are not united socially in terms of identity. My other point would be with regard to the bedrock of Malaysia is built upon the principles of accommodation. We can see this through the embedded social contract that respect the rights of others while preserving its own indigenous identity. For this, the principles of Rukun Negara promotes this, where social contract in the federal constitution accommodates all Malaysians by protecting the right of all while respecting its rules. Rukun Negara as a concept is highly inclusive to all and does not specifically discriminate against any race, religious or cultural background. The reciprocal of religious tolerance between non-Muslims and Muslims is displayed through the accepting recital of prayers in open uh, in open event, we have five azan in some places in Sango, we have additional azan uh, uh, one hour before Subo, Bazaar, Ramadan, and Hari Raya. We, I think, we live in peace. And although there are a few cases, I think, hiccup cases uh, that leads to some discussion, but I think relatively we live in a peace harmony. Furthermore, other than religious tolerance, the vernacular school systems allow the Chinese and Tamil schools to assist with government support. The Chinese and Tamil programs are broadcast on national TV and radio to cater to each community's demand. On this occasion, there is a great deal of cross-cultural intermingling and diversity in Malaysia was not a matter of choice, but it was forced upon the country by the colony as historical facts that define the contemporary realities. And this has been highlighted by Kartini Abu Talib. So if you can see a model nation of democracy in Malaysia, the 2018 general election, in which the first time, for the first time, BN government falls out of power, and there is a smooth transition of power to the PH government, shows that Malaysian democracy is healthy and on track. Democratic processes in the country also never resorts to violence, despite current instabilities in the current government. As a relatively small nation, Malaysia's strengths may not lie in terms of geography, military, or even economy, but more on diplomacy and trade. Malaysia has been vocal in many foreign issues involving Muslims such as Palestine, Kashmir, Uyghur, has been a strong pressure group 
there are still rooms for improvement. And for this, Malaysia, as a founding member of the OIC, Malaysia plays an important role in the establishment of the organization. And of course, our first Prime Minister, the late Tunku Abdul Rahman, was selected as the first regional of the OIC. And Malaysia, until today, continues to play an active role in the organization. Malaysia is also part of the D8 Organization of Economic Cooperation for Developing Muslim Nations. So in this part of the world, both Malaysia and Indonesia be the member of D8. And the combined population of the eight countries is about 1 billion or 60% of all Muslims or close to 13% of the world's population and covering an area of 7.6 million square kilometers, 5% of world land area. In 2006, trade between the D8 member states stood at 35 billion US dollars and it was around 68 billion US dollars in 2010. So transaction between the eight developing countries accounted for 3.3% of world trade in 2010. So one of the, uh, on another point of the uh, development that taking place in Malaysia, one of the most recent attempts by Malaysia is to enhance its international role in hosting the KL Summit in 2019, where about 450 foreign delegates from 56 countries, including the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Ali Sani, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani attended the summit. And at the end of the summit, five major issues that receive primary focus are the Rohingya refugee crisis, Uyghur uh, mass detention in China, the war in Yemen, gender equality, and economic disparity. Despite there are some restrictions and pressure by some of the Muslim leaders to attend. On the refugee policies, yes? Okay, on the refugee pol uh, policies, so far has been a very generous host but there remain vast room for improvement in terms of policies. For instance, Malaysia has been one of the highly preferred destinations for Rohingya refugees. Malaysia is currently hosting more than 150,000 UNCHR registered Rohingya refugees. In the early stages of the pandemic, the government has responded with many positive policies, such as providing free COVID-19 testing for refugees, Nevertheless, issues such as immigration rates and refugee detentions continue to receive many criticism. Among the major issues in Malaysia, refugees' policies is the lack of refugee law framework, the lack of a consistent refugee policy, and the lack of formalized government-led integration or social security policies is currently compensated for by informal support system and networks, and I think there are quite a lot of NGOs that support this. The country has the potential to lead the way in refugee management by building on existing protection activities and through close cooperation and collaboration with current regional framework such as ASEAN and international forums such as the Bali process on people smuggling, trafficking in persons and transnational crime, what we call it the Bali process. On the note from the Indonesian perspective, where there are not only the biggest Muslim country, but a democratic country who had set up itself in addressing issues such as extremism, and how would be the future Muslim leadership taking into the Indonesian account? Let me just share with the remaining time I have. Yes, definitely like Malaysia, Indonesia benefited from being a Southeast Asian Muslim country. The nation also has a huge potential in terms of population and economy. Indonesia has the fourth largest population and currently the 15th largest economy in terms of GDP. It is also predicted to become the fourth largest economy by 2045. The this, uh, dissipating or weakening of Saudi leadership in recent years due to international controversies like Jamal Khashoggi's assassination, his interventionist policies in Yemen, and the ongoing normalization process with Israel opens up more space for new leadership among Muslim countries. And among these potential new leaders, according to experts, are Turkey, Indonesia, 
as well as Malaysia. And of course, if you go to any part of the Muslim countries, these three countries have been mentioned. Since the mid 20s, uh, mid 2000s, Jakarta has played an important role in, per, in precipitating conflict resolution within the Islamic world. Indonesia mediated the OIC sessions on the Israeli Palestinian conflict and contentious negotiation between the United States and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's administration in Iran. In addition, Indonesia has worked on strengthening the voice of peripheral Muslim countries in the relevant international organization. This past leadership provides initial leverage in Indonesia, which is home to more than 230 million Muslims who use the desert, the authority over the Islamic community. Indonesia, historic, Indonesia historic power brokering is not its sole starting advantage. The country is home to 13% of all Muslims and copious resources of oil and gas. The latter could help Indonesia outvie Saudi Arabia while the former stands out in its jurisdictional pluralism. Unlike the Sunni doctrines in Riyadh, Nusantara's Muslims are seen to be more closely aligned to the Islamic doctrine of al wasatiyah that is moderation and de-radicalization. The Pancasila embedded in Indonesia's constitution, in which the Rukun Nagara shares many similarities, has strong potential to establish consensus among disparate Muslim groups. With demographic changes shifting the balance of power in the Islamic world towards East or Southeast Asia, Indonesia could capitalize on its foundation to generate considerable soft power influence. And my last point of my presentation, nevertheless, Indonesia's Islamic pluralism can be seen as, as upsetting for conservative groups. So there is no guarantee that other nations and their Muslim population will be more receptive to Indonesia's leadership. Bid. Jakarta has yet to uproot domestic extremism, despite there are having caught a number of I mean, new laws taking shape of this, especially with regard to his Tahrir in the recent case and convert export revenue into sustainable development. Rural Indonesian citizens still experience widespread poverty, and the country spends just 1% of its GDP on social protection. With that, I end my presentation. Ataf, thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Zaman. It was a really enlightening uh, presentation. You said really interesting things. I mean, I'm very glad that you talked about peripheral Muslim countries, and I think that a lot of uh, attention to be given in that. And a very interesting concept, cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism means inclusivity and diversity. Okay, so um, thank you again. Now we're going to our second distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Hayrodi Alvinin. Um, he was also an associate professor at the Department of Malay Studies, National University of Singapore. He specializes on the history of Southeast Asia covering topics such as intellectual history, religious cosmopolitanism, and social movements beyond the region. Um, he received his bachelor's and master's degree both at NUS, then completed his PhD at um, School of Oriental and African Studies as well. Um, he is currently working on two projects, which is the first is the history of Islam in Malaysia, and second, exploring the Malay-Singaporean diaspora in Melbourne, Brisbane, and Sydney. So without further ado, um, the room is yours, Dr. Yeah. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, Professor Osman Baka, whom uh, I regard as my own teacher. Uh, we were neighbors in um, Brunei Darussalam once. And I learned a lot when uh, I was there with him. I'll be going also to Brunei again this December. Professor Azam and Tunku, uh, part and parcel of uh, today's very interesting session on governance. Uh, we have heard a lot from Professor Osman Baka just now and a lot of points uh, that we can pick up for today's discussion. What I want to emphasize right now is actually on the issue of ideas and thought. And I think this is the project that Professor Osman Baka has been pursuing throughout his whole life. And I will discuss this in the later slide, but one of those things that he has always emphasized when it comes to changing and reforming the Muslim world is to change the ways in which Muslims are thinking. And when we can change how Muslims think, 
and how especially our intellectuals think, then we can initiate changes on the ground. And this is the issue that I'm going to uh, try and address today, how uh, an epistemological reform is something that we sorely need in the Muslim world before we can talk about reform in governance. Because if we do not change the ideas, if we do not change how um, Muslims think, how we conceptualize realities and the world, we will encounter the same problems that we have faced for the last 200 years. And one of those problems is the problems of governance, political corruption, environmental degrada degradation, moral decadence, and economic instability. So what I want to do today is actually to emphasize on the roles of Soviet Asian scholars and intellectuals, and why we must start to universalize the ideas from this part of the world in our attempt to think through and to reform governance in an age of identity politics. So I want to uh, begin by talking about the realities of the world right now. Uh, we're talking about geopolitics. I'm not an expert on international relations or geopolitics, but what I, would, what I want to talk about is basically the, the state of the world right now that affects how geopolitical issues are being discussed and why so much problems are now taking place, especially in the Muslim world, but also all over the world. Uh, why we must be attentive to this issue of identity politics and how Southeast Asian Muslim intellectualism can provide uh, a necessary corrective to these problems. And here, uh, I want to emphasize on what we can do. And I think uh, in many of the conferences that we attend, there's always a, a kind of lamentation amongst us Muslims. Okay, yes, we are in the face of so many problems. Yes, we have models all over the world. Uh, model Muslim countries, Turkey, Malaysia, and so forth and so forth. Uh, but we do not know how to move forward with these models that we claim uh, to have amongst ourselves. And this is where, sorry, the, the word uh, went haywire a bit. This is where I want to talk about how, um, what intellectuals and educators, uh, educators can do. So here uh, is the call to action. And since ABEM is the main organizer of uh, this conference, the things that I want people in ABIM and those who are attending this conference to get on doing. And I think this is the issue with us, uh, generally Muslims. Uh, we talk a lot, but we don't do a lot. And this is what we, we got to do. We have to engage more at the realm of ideas. And here, Professor Osman Baka again becomes a kind of um, beacon for us, a, lime, a limelight for us because even at his, at his age, he's actively writing and engaging. And I'm going to talk about one of the issues that he has been engaging on, but seldom do we actually pay a lot of attention to. Um, Chairman, if I become a little bit uh, overly uh, enthusiastic, uh, do tell me because I tend to move a lot when I, when I speak because a lot of young people here, so you got to be a little bit more energetic. Um, and of course, it, it's online, you know, you want to make people a bit more engaged, so I tend to to move quite a bit. Uh, so I want to begin first with this whole, the age of identity politics that we are in. And I've discussed this in a few places. I want to repeat it here again, that at the end of the day, it is quite known to all intellectuals all over the world and known to even policymakers all over the world that we are in the face of an upsurge of identity politics. And this has been so for many decades, but now it has become even more powerful than ever before. Francis, Francis Fukuyama in his book, Identity, Contemporary Identity Politics and the Struggle for Recognition say that the demand for recognition of one's identity is a master concept that unifies much of what is going on in world politics today. So if you look at the right-wing movements in Europe, if you look at Islamic, the second wave of Islamic resurgence that's happening, the issues that we see uh, in Afghanistan, and also the wars that we see in many parts of the world, including the Muslim world, it is all, much of it are basically stemming from identity politics. And it is not confined to identity politics that are practiced on university campuses or only to white nationalism that it has provoked, but extends to a wider, broader phenomenon such as the search of old-fashioned nationalism, 
we are getting more nationalistic than ever before. Malaysians see themselves different from Singaporeans. Singaporeans see themselves different from Indonesians. Southeast Asians see themselves very much totally different from the rest of the Muslim world. In as much as we want to pay attention to our unique identities, we also need to understand that sometimes in paying attention to our unique identities, we tend to turn it into practical politics that exclude others. And this is the issue that we are faced with right now. Uh, uh, Kwame Anthony Api, another philosopher, said that this whole identity politics that we are looking in right now and we are experiencing right now uh, manifested at different levels, at the level of creed, what we believe, at the level of country, we differentiate ourselves in terms of countries. Hence, this whole idea of universalism is now at, uh, at risk. We are in the face of color differences, and this is becoming even more chronic than ever before. Uh, in as much as we want to talk about being cosmopolitan, the division between the whites and the blacks, the colored and the non-colored, even amongst the Malay community, the Malay Muslim community, the Muslim community, this issue of being dark is seen as a problem than being light colored is a big issue in the US right now. Culture of people who, who, who belong to different cultures are seen differently and more importantly, the whole issue of class. Whereas capitalism is basic, global capitalism is basically rearing its ugly head, the differences between class, which then enters into differences between religious uh, ideologies becomes even more and more um, apparent than ever before. And this has entered into the virtual world. So if you look at young people right now, a lot of them are influenced by, by very diverse ideas about race, gender, sexuality, nation, color, uh, because of the things that they are exposed to online. Hashtag identity, hashtag identity politics is actually the big thing. So I want to begin with that. For us to understand that the world that we are in right now is a highly fractious world and people are being fragmented so much because of these different levels of identity politics. Now, I don't want to paint a doom and gloom uh, picture. The whole purple, purpose of the Noor conference, and I like the word Noor because we are supposed to give light to the world, is to try to find a way out of these issues that we are faced with right now. And this is where I believe, and I strongly have faith in this, that Southeast Asia intellectuals, Southeast Asian intellectual, uh, Muslim intellectualism, can provide a corrective to some of these problems. But we must begin first by recognizing that the ideas of people from this part of the world are relevant for the whole of mankind. And this is the first thing, the one point that I want to make here today, that one issue that we are faced with among Southeast Asian intellectuals, especially Southeast Asian Muslim intellectuals, is that they look down at their own ideas. They do not see that their ideas can actually be relevant for the rest of the world. And this is not so when we look at the rest of the, uh, the Muslim world. Arab ideas, Turkish ideas, Indian ideas are entering into our shores. But our ideas are not going to the other side. And the reason is because we are not confident with our own ideas. And we do not see that our ideas can actually provide the antidotes that mankind, humankind, actually need. So uh, Prof, uh, Professor Azam just now mentioned about uh, the book that I wrote, and I just want to re-emphasize the point again, that at the end of the day, Southeast Asia provide the first big idea that we provide to the world is the idea of cosmopolitanism. And it is a cosmopolitanism that is very rooted in our Adat, and one thing that we do not recognize in the, in the Malay Adat, in the Southeast Asian Adat, is the Adat of kehalusan, subtleness, the Adat of respect, kehormat atau, uh, peng penghormatan atau hormat, and more importantly, the, the Adat of tolong menolong, or, or we say gotong royong antara satu sama lain. And this is the thing that uh, part of the project that we need to do is to now rewrite and represent some of these things that are happening in our societies for other societies to know, to understand, and to implement in that society. And I show that intellectuals such as Hamka uh, have put out many of these ideas in Bahasa Indonesia or Bahasa Melayu, but many of these ideas are not actually communicated to the rest of the world. And this is my point always to the brothers in Indonesia. They are 300 million strong but they talk among themselves. And it's not so the case in Malaysia, but still, 
there is a very strong sense of parochialism, provincialism. It's all idea that we talk amongst each other. And this is something that we need to come up from. That talking among each other was necessary in the time of people like Hamka. But even Hamka, when he wrote uh, his own Tafsir Al-Azhar, named it Tafsir Al-Azhar because he wanted the people at Al-Azhar to see that this Tafsir is equally good as the other Tafsir that you see in the rest of the Muslim world. And in the third book, and here is the, the point for Malaysians, I wrote the entire book and uh, thank you for, uh, to Prof. Osman Baka also for giving me the inspiration to write this book when I was in Georgetown University. I showed in the book that Malaysia, Islam in Malaysia has a history of close to a thousand years. And in that history, you see many intellectuals, thinkers and um, activists that were produced that gave inspiration to the rest of the region as well as the world as a whole. Now, we have a problem of not appreciating our own history, that at the end of the day, our own history, as the subtitle here shows, is entwined with the rest of the world. Communicating with one another, connecting with one another. Um, I still feel like even writing after three books, um, Southeast Asians are not actually reading them and using them. I feel very happy that Abim is now using the whole idea of Muslim cosmopolitanism as part and parcel of their project of trying to amend and remedy some problems in society. So I wrote another book, and this time Prof. Osman Baka is in it. It's going to come out, inshallah, uh, in 2022, again, uh, by Oxford University Press. Um, and in this book, I emphasize that there are seven intellectuals. Uh, they are all Southeast Asians coming from Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, and other parts of Southeast Asia and the Philippines who have contributed to the thinking about Islam. So hope uh, you all will pray that this book will uh, come out uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and the whole purpose of the book is to show that they are the shapers of Islam in Southeast Asia. Not only that, many of their ideas are actually relevant for global Islam as a whole, as we overcome some of these problems of governance, problems of identity politics, and more importantly, problems of reform in our own society. Right, so this is uh, going to come out, and I, I just want to share that these are the works of intellectuals of the past. They have done their jobs. Our uh, task is to use these ideas and to transform it, critique it, and build upon them in order to chart the way forward for us right now in the face of many issues of our time. And this is where. Um, I mentioned in, in my book that we need to now recover a style of thought, a habit of seeing the world, a way of living that is rooted in the idea that everyone is part of a common humanity. We need to now universalize many of our ideas. They are uniquely Southeast Asian, uh, intrinsically Malay, but they are all for everybody. And this is my call for the youth out there. You are here not because of you being part and parcel of this part of the world, but that you are now part of, the, of a common humanity, you are accountable to God, and that we are morally responsible towards people all over the world, right? And how then can we actually um, move forward with what we have? And here, I just want to move to the last part. Uh, Chairman, I think I have five minutes more. I'm going to wrap up very, very soon. Um, what can we intellectuals actually do? How can we build upon the ideas of people like Prof. Osman Baka, Prof. Nakib Alatas, uh, Harun Nasution, uh, and uh, Zakia Darajat, all of these thinkers, Siza Majul Adib, and so forth and so forth, and, and build something new up to come out, out of this quandary that we are in. The first thing that we should do is now is to be in touch with the problems of the ground and do not be elitist in the things that we do. And this is the issue with so many academics right now. We are armchair critics who are not able to communicate our ideas to the people out there. Uh, many people will say that how I am presenting a lot of my ideas seems to be very flamboyant, doesn't seem to be so-called like the boring professors out there who's just reading the paper and letting everybody just appreciate whatever good points that they are trying to bring up. My point has always been, and here I am with Frank Reddy about it, we have a problem of intellectuals not being able to communicate ideas to the larger public out there. They are elitist, out of touch, and they are actually marginal. They are bizarre, they are self-indulgent, and they are always irrelevant. And we must become a new crop of intellectuals who go beyond that. And here, 
what we need to do is to first uh, teach universal Islamic ethics. And I want to emphasize on this point that one of the issues that we have right now is that Islamic ethics have not become a discussion that is widespread in the larger Muslim world. And when we talk about ethics, we are talking about things that make us good human beings. And this we need to emphasize because the whole structure or edifice of Islam is based on character. Rasulullah SAW emphasized that at the end of the day, it is the refinement of the character, the refinement of ethical conduct that is at the core of Islam. But this ethical conduct must be transposed in the intellectual way for other people to see that Islamic ethics is not necessarily only for Muslims. And here, there's a lot of literature out there that is emphasizing on the importance of global ethics, on Islamic ethics. The first project that I hope the young intellectuals will do is to revisit and re-examine ethics as it has been understood in Islam, and more importantly, how it has been understood by Malays, Indonesians, Filipinos, and others. How do we understand the meaning of ethics? What does this whole idea of menjadi orang yang lebih berakhlak means from this part of the world? And what does it take to refine our character? And this refinement of character is to me the most important thing for us to give birth to good leaders in society. Professor Nagib Alata said that the corruption that you see in society has much to do with the problem of adab. I agree with him on this point, but I feel that the corruption has much to do with the corruption of the akhlaq. People who have bad akhlaq right, uh, will give birth to bad policies. And this is the thing that we need to talk about. How to create leaders with good akhlaq, not only in the akhlaq that he shows to people out there, to the media, but akhlaq to himself and akhlaq to uh, God as well. So that's the first. The second one that we need to talk about is this whole idea of everyday justice. We always talk about redistributive justice. We're talking about justice in terms of the court of law, but we don't talk about justice at an everyday level. And this is why the problems of governance and poverty especially is so endemic in the Muslim world. Because Muslim scholars are always talking about justice when it comes to ahkam, halal, haram, and so forth and so forth. Uh, whether these policies are supposed to be implemented or not. But what we don't emphasize is the whole justice at an everyday life. That when you see that something is wrong, you actually amend it there and then. And this is something that Professor Osman Baka has actually talked about uh, in his um, lecture, Islam as a way of truth and justice. Please revisit uh, this lecture again, which is part and parcel of um, the ISTEC lectures, where he talks about justice as not only an ideal to be implemented by people who are enforcers of law, rather justice is the way of life of every Muslim. And I, I, I have said this before in another lecture that the problem that we see in the Muslim world, especially in Southeast Asia, is that we can actually tolerate everyday injustice thinking that things will be sorted out by itself. And one example is to see our neighbors poor, uh, in Indonesia, whenever I go there, you have people out there without food while intellectuals in their conferences are eating a lot of food. We have lost this whole idea of amending. Man ra'a minkum munkaran fa yugayiru biyadi. That we change it. When we say something that is wrong, we change it. And if you cannot change it with your hand, you change it with your uh, lisan. If not change it with your lisan, you change it with your heart. And wadhalika ak'aful iman. That is the lowest of iman. So, it has to be talked about, it has to be implemented. And in the US, in Japan, because of the problems that the American society, the European societies are faced with right now, the whole notion of everyday justice, keadilan sehari-harian, is now uh, being debated and uh, they are trying to uh, come up with new curriculums uh, in their educational system to ensure that people recognize injustice when they see it and try to amend it. And last but not least is to recover or to overcome the whole issue of dehumanization. Whether we realize it or not, we are becoming more and more dehumanized. We are online longer than we are offline. We are talking to people whom we do not see, whom we cannot feel, whom we cannot touch, 
more than we are talking to our own children, our own spouses, our own friends. And this is the tragedy of the world that we are in today, that the dehumanization is happening because of the internet, because of the social media, where it is a process whereby humans treat other humans without common dignity, civility, or other traits, which hint at a recognition of those persons as equally human on a fundamental level. So we need to talk about this more. We need to write about this more, especially from the Islamic point of view. How now can we recover the fitra of the human being? Again, a recent book that has just been published, just came out this year, and I would recommend everybody here to read, Sculpting the Self, Islam, Selfhood, and Human Flourishing. And the author basically argues for this, that at the core of Islam is the recovery of the human self, of being human. And we need to talk about this again. My appeal to Professor Osman Bakar, I'm always giving him a lot of work. I hope that he will give lectures on, on this. That what does it mean to be a human being in this time and age? How can we recover the fitrah of, uh, of the insan again? And when we can recover the fitra of the insan, as this book argues, it will lead to human flourishing. And it all begins to me from us Muslims recovering our sense of humanity, our sense of being human in order for us to change the larger society out there. In pursuit of this, I'm actually writing a book right now just to end uh, about Sufism in Southeast Asia, a long history again from the 8th until the 20th, 21st century. And part of the thing that I want to emphasize in the book is this whole idea that the core, at the core of Tasawuf is the recovery of the self, the recovery of the nas, the recovery of the fitra of humankind, which when it is recovered, it would lead to changes, not only at the level of governance, but at the level of everyday life. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Khairuddin. Um, yes, that was a really interesting talk. And you really, the three last key points that you really showed was very interesting. Universal uh, Islamic ethics, uh, justice, and addressing dehumanization. And I think that is just so even beyond um, this conference. So just before I forget, for those who are listening in, if you would like to type down your questions in advance, please do so on the, in the chat box and I will read them out later. Or else you could wait until the end where we will open up our q &A. Okay, so now we've come to our last but not least uh, speaker. Uh, um, <clears throat> Yang Amat Mulia Tunku Zain and Abidin Ibn Tunku uh, Mufri. Um, he is currently the founding president of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. We all mostly know as IDEAS. Um, which is a think tank that pursues market based solutions to public policy challenges. Um, apart from that, he's also a trustee of um, Yayasa Jalkit, Yayasa Munara, Yayasa Ideas, and the Generation Foundation. A graduate from the London School of Economics and Political Science, he obtained his master's in comparative politics and went on to work in the UK Houses of Parliament, the World Bank, and United Nations Development Program, just to name a few. And of course, he has maintained a newspaper column across five newspapers known as hashtag Abidin Ideas in the Star, Team 2 and Borneo Post where he has written extensively about uh, Malaysia uh, and he's also an Eisenhower Fellow and has been going on leadership programs and speaking tours to a number of countries including Australia, France, European Union and Singapore. So without further ado, the floor is your elephant. Thank you so much, Abdaf. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and a very good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. It is really a privilege and an honor to be here. I was so moved by uh, Professor Osman's uh, uh, lecture earlier. Uh, and it's a truly um, astonishing that I am following both Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Khairul. I know we are behind time. Uh, so I, I know I'm behind, we're behind time, so I shall keep my comments very brief. Um, in, in pondering this, this, the title of this session, um, Creating uh, Balance in the Alignment of Order Post-COVID-19, and in listening to the two presentations we just heard, I think there are a number of things which, as Muslims and as Malaysians, it's important for us to uh, acknowledge and understand um, before sort of tackling 
what it means when we are trying to sort of aim for order um, in the post-COVID uh, world in Southeast Asia. And I think some of these have already been touched on, but if I may just summarize five or six. One is to acknowledge the rich history of um, this region. I mean, Professor Osman and um, Dr. Haridin spoke of the cosmopolitanism of, of the region. Uh, you know, cosmopolitanism and um, being at the heart of a geopolitically interesting region is nothing new. Um, right back from the time of Majapahit and Srivijaya, but thereafter, uh, Malaysians love to talk about the Sultanate of Malacca, right, as their golden age, the golden sultanate. Um, and, but often we don't ask why was it that it was successful? What were the policies that made it prosperous? What was the environment that attracted people from all over the world to do, uh, to do trade there? Um, other, uh, other areas of great prosperity, like the old uh, Sultanate of, of Kedah, for example, um, the, the, the interactions with Admiral Cheng Ho, the arrival of uh, Hang Li Po again in, in, in Malacca, what, you know, very often these stories are told in a peaceful fashion without really understanding why is it that these places were of interest um, to them. Of course, being from uh, Negris Milan and, 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 and all the references to Nusantara, uh, I'll remember also um, the, the, the Adat of the Minangkabau and our propensity of Marangtau, this idea that um, before Westphalian sovereignty, um, moving around uh, from, from place to place was a perfectly uh, normal part of our, of our Adat. And even in the accommodation of Islam and um, Adat, you know, in, 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 um, in Negris Milan and, and of course back in Pagaruyong, there was the saying, Adat bersindi Shara, Shara bersindi Kitabulok, right? So that whole accommodation and that understanding that Adat exists uh, and the religion exists, and um, adaptation must occur, uh, synthesis must occur um, for the benefit of the people who are being governed um, under, in, in the polities that were there. The second thing is to acknowledge, of course, that ever since then, we have had a journey of colonialism and post-colonialism where uh, nation states have emerged, and furthermore, um, in, in the context of Southeast Asia, uh, not only New Santara, but all the parts of Southeast Asia um, have evolved with different structures of government. So within Southeast Asia, and that includes the four New Santaran countries that have been mentioned, we have different structures of government, for example. We have an absolute monarchy, we have constitutional monarchy, we have uh, presidential republics, we have Westminster style uh, democracies with uh, re re Republican uh, head of state as well. Uh, and we also have um, one party states. And so if you want to expand it more broadly, across the Muslim world, we have um, some uh, military uh, regimes, we have some authoritarian dictatorships. Um, and that extends, of course, to understandings of economics as well. We have had laissez-faire capitalism, we have had experiments with uh, socialist uh, attitudes. And the thing is, within each of these countries and where there are Muslims, you will always find uh, Muslims who will argue that this is a Muslim form of government, right? And so we have to accept the reality that among Muslims, there are those who, we will never find uh, agreement 100% as to what um, Islamic governance will look like. And I think Osman, Professor Osman earlier was um, articulated very well that and went back to the sources to argue that um, the, the, the concepts of shura, um, the principle of good governance is what runs through um, what it means to be, um, what Muslim governments should look like. But beyond that, what, is the, you know, what are the institutions? Um, you know, that those things are up for, up for debate. And that leads me to my, to my fourth point, which is we have to also recognize in Malaysia that there are huge and deep divisions between Muslims about what a good um, Muslim, uh, Islamic state, I suppose, 
or governance under an Islamic system should look like. Um, and references have already been made to the, to the domestic political situation, but everyone knows that uh, we have majority Malay, we have more majority Malay Muslim parties, political parties in Malaysia now than ever before. So the idea is, you know, when Malaysians talk about uh, unity among the Malays, it's very uh, ironic that they do so in a, in a period where there are ever more and more uh, Malay Muslim political parties who are competing against each other. And so what then does that mean? How then do we um, address um, this idea of finding balance? I think to me, if, if Professor, if Dr. Haridin was talking about intellectualism, I think to me the other, the twin factor there is civil society. And I think it is civil society that um, encapsulates what Shura is about in some ways, because it's civil society that acts as a mediator between parliamentarians, between, the, between government, between, um, sorry, between um, the bureaucracy and between the public at large between universities. And so when we are trying to formulate what it means to have a Muslim response to, for example, the refugee issue, I think it's very important that civil society plays a role in for calling out right, some of the contradictions that exist when politicians might say, we must stand up for our Rohingya brothers and sisters, or you know, we must defend our Palestinian brothers and sisters. But then when it comes to policy, um, you know, why is it that Malaysia hasn't uh, recognized the um, UN Convention on Refugees, for example, right? So it's, it's, it's important that there are platforms that um, the different statements of politicians and what they supposedly believe um, is, can be further discussed. So I would like to congratulate, of course, the NOR conference. Uh, you know, this is the first ever conference of this nature. And this is such an important step towards normalizing that discussion and debate. I mean, if you want to talk about uh, climate change, for example, what is the Muslim, what should the Muslim response be? Well, of course, we can refer back to uh, Quran and Hadith and find so many examples of how important it is to, to take care of the environment. But when you, know, when you bring it down to policy, what can we do in ASEAN? So when we talk about transboundary haze pollution, for example, Again, what civil society can do in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Singapore, in Brunei, um, is to inject some of these uh, tenets that, that emerge from our, uh, from our beliefs as Muslims as to why it is that protecting rivers is important, saving the tigers is important, and preventing transplantary haze uh, is important. But I want to maybe just finish by Come referring to what Professor Karudin said about the rise of identity politics, and that certainly is something that we um, encounter uh, a huge amount in at Ideas and all my other organizations. But there's also, I think, uh, already quite a strong uh, antidote to that in the energy and the um, enthusiasm of young people in ASEAN. So normally, when I talk about ASEAN, uh, matters, or normally when I speak to people across ASEAN, it's not about you know Muslim perspectives. It's more about um, volunteerism. It's more about what civil society can, how civil society can strengthen themselves to create uh, more coordination across ASEAN amongst young people. And I have to say that although it's true that you know we have become dehumanized and being more online than offline, sometimes that is also. Um, a very positive thing. So uh, just last week, um, I was speaking to about 100 uh, young uh, people from across ASEAN. So this is UKM, so it's very interesting. Of course, ABIM has its home in UKM, but UKM today is also uh, very involved in the uh, UKM Youth uh, Volunteer Program, which regularly brings people from all across ASEAN together, specifically to tackle matters of an environment, uh, heritage protection, um, educational reform, and I think when you, when we, when even of course during the COVID nineteen pandemic, we're forced to do things online. But these platforms are a huge um, opportunity for uh, exchanging of stories uh, and for coordination. I think if there's one thing that young people in ASEAN can do better than any generation before, it's coordinating their efforts 
to, um, uh, to, to, to press for change and furthermore, to create proof of concept projects to show to the politicians that, hey, you know, we can set up a school with these concepts and we can export these to the other countries um, and um, uplift people in the, in the most deprived communities in each of our countries. Um, and I think if we can do the same thing across Muslim um, Nusantara, then I think that would be a very, very uh, positive and promising way to remove some of the monopoly from, from the diplomats and the politicians when sort of uh, uh, seeking uh, pan uh, Southeast Asian um, uh, movements. So with that, I look forward to the uh, question and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that comes to the end of the... Sorry, I'm, I'm, is that my exit? Okay, sorry. Um, so that comes to the end of our uh, presentations of the three times. So just a short summary, uh, uh, so that to just uh, before we lead to the question and answer session, I think one of the key things that really came out from all three speakers was that the foundations of cosmopolitanism in Southeast Asia, in particular Malaysia and Asia, is strong. We have the basis within uh, the Islamic space to further strengthen and to further provide alternatives towards the challenges that we are facing as global citizens. However, the challenge remains is how do you think, how do you move from these ideas, these interpretations to concrete policies, to concrete solutions, and as well as action on the ground itself. And um, with all these challenges today, the key groups that will be dealing with these challenges is the youth and the fact that at the end of it, it's probably the youth as well that will actually have to um, uh, address these, uh, the, the, the challenges that have been faced. Therefore, what are their roles within um, the solutions that have been put forward? Okay, so we have about, I know we're slightly over time, but because we also started late, so we have about um, plus minus about 30 minutes for Q&A. So um, the floor is open. Um, does anybody, um, have any questions for the panelists? Or perhaps while the others are trying to formulate their questions in their mind, we actually have three questions written here by Helmi from Ideas. So there are three questions and it's not referred to any particular speaker. So I will actually allow all three speakers to address uh, these questions. The first question, how does the narrative, how does narratives, beneficial and corrosive in social media influence or disrupt policy making, good governance, geopolitics and democracy? Secondly, with COVID-19 still lingering and economic recovery survival being prioritized for the next couple of years, there are us does our advocacy agenda face limitations? And if it does, what is needed to adapt to such uh, adversity, to bridge the gaps of inequality across communities and begin to build sustainable communities? Okay. And third, what sort of conversations from us that the public hear that needs to be put on to be put forward as core communications to address the problem of leadership? So these are three questions. Perhaps um, the panelists can answer these three questions first. Um, maybe we'll start with um, Dr. Azam. Okay, thank you, Atam. I will not to, I will not uh, uh, respond to all the questions, the three okay, questions, okay. but I will just respond uh, one or two of it. I think we regard to uh, how influence that would be the social media um, towards these uh, stakeholders uh, with regard to uh, policy, uh, making to, to make sure that we can have this, uh, I mean, good governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think we are living in this modern technology where uh, social media plays an important role, and I think the government as well as the stakeholders, uh, I think not only in Malaysia, I think in other part of the world, I think take it seriously. Whatever things that crop up uh, on this social media. 
And I give you one very simple example uh, of what had taken place uh, before. I think while KJ was cycling, I think from uh, Bandar Rimbayu towards this Richarding, towards I think Banting, uh, there was a potholes and he fell off, I suppose. And he took a shot of picture and shared it uh, on Twitter. Immediately, the response from the local uh, municipal, uh, I mean, uh, local, I mean, I mean, municipal, I think that one is from, I suppose, is uh, under Kuala Langat jurisdiction. Uh, I need mean, in immediate action, I mean, take care of the thing. And then the, uh, the netizens and also uh, they share in the social media how there are several cases at the same spot where people, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, got, I mean, uh, I think there is even, if not mistaken, one uh, incident that one man, uh, I mean, died because of this. I mean, fallen from that because of that post. So this gives some input to how the, I mean, the systems of the governance in Malaysia, in particular, this uh, municipal council to take care of the goodness of the people. And there's so many other things with regard to big, big, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, issues, like how to want to have this reformation, the parliament reformations, and then these uh, ideas of where the government has agreed, both, I mean, all the parliamentarians has, have agreed, to, to reduce the age of, of this uh, 18 uh, for them to able to cast vote in the next election. But there are lots of things uh, by, the, by, 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 by the government, especially, I mean, the SPR, uh, quite of, quite of lots of excuses where they said it would take more time, uh, I mean, to, to, for this to be implemented. And, and when, the instability of the governments of today, where we have three prime ministers in three, uh, I think three years or four months, that has taken the shape of different approach. I think the, the present government has stressed for the uh, SPR to take care of this and make sure that by the next election, PRU 15, GE 15, perhaps that will take place perhaps next year or, or the following year, that the youth by the, at the age of 18 can go out and come. I think this has been something that I think uh, has changed the things. And of course, with regard to this, uh, the, the, uh, the, the question number three, I believe that uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to talk about other countries. I'm talking about Malaysia. I think it's, uh, we have enough of these senior leaders, especially that taking shape uh, the country. We need to change, I think. I think we can see from some countries where uh, young leaders are given the opportunity uh, to, to take lead of the country. And with some advisors from the seniors, they have changed a lot. And of course, with the presence of the uh, half of the population in Malaysia, uh, youth, I think we should give some sort of room, at least a 30%, perhaps in the next PRU 15, a new young blood to become the Adun or to become the MPs. And this will take and shape the difference of the future of the countries, be it from uh, the economic perspective, the social perspective, and also if you're talking about uh, despite religion, uh, is a matter of state. I think these also can also be taken care of. I think that would be my, uh, I, I, I mean, my simple answer for that. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Um, Doctor Khairuddin? Yeah, um, thank you, Hilmi, for asking the question. So I think I, I'll just um, answer all three questions at once. And with regards to the internet issue, it's linked also to these uh, problems that we face in the midst of COVID. I think what we need right now is actually to move beyond toxic and negative discussions um, that we have always been engaging with online and offline. 
and this again it ties in into this whole identity politics thing identity politics have become even fractious in the internet due to the rise of groups and uh, politicians coming into the fray as well um, and i think the way to go for the young people right now is to talk less about things that divide us and to talk more if i can underline what tunku was saying just now on things that we share especially the 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 problems of this pandemic right and this is very difficult especially for young people who are online the sensational the negative the corrosive the um in a sense a uh, high sounding things are the things that we like we like to fight a lot online we like to discuss about um things that divide us a lot and we need to move on and that's why i said just now the cosmopolitan trait that we already have is something that we need to underline and this is difficult and challenging but it is not impossible the way to talk about things more positively is to first understand that we share common problems we share common crises we share common challenges and we share the same aspiration of wanting to craft a better future for everyone and for people of different creeds race class and so forth and so forth so this is what we need to do and again like i said in order to do that we need to sort out the things right here uh the modern mind or some say the postmodern mind is used to deconstructing and professor osman baka also has an essay on this on on how postmodernism actually allows us to be critical over the things around us but push to the to its logical extreme what postmodernism has done what these ideas that we are now uh taking in can actually make us become skeptic and cynics and this skepticism and cynicism that we have makes us talk about things always in a negative light so there's a lot of sound there's no light now in the internet there's a lot of sound uh in parliaments but there's not not much light going on uh, and we need to turn this around and we can turn this around by changing how we think right that's all thank you very much um over to you uh ketua tv I think there's a lovely uh, continuity between the, the different questions. On the first question about uh, social media, I think I've already yes, there is certainly a lot of toxicity there. It's very easy to get embroiled in these negative discussions. It's very easy to feel very angry and passionate and then lash out and then it becomes a spiral of negativity. But as I also mentioned, there is already quite a strong there are very many many organizations many groups many voluntary um gatherings online which are the opposite of that they are positive they want to help the community uh they want to talk about ideas and they actually contribute to the policy uh discussion and specifically during uh covid-19 there were so many of these uh movements that uh were set up to help people who were particularly damaged by covid-19 of course one which ideas was involved with is the partnership with uh, project bangsa malaysia where we raised over 2 million uh, nearly 2 million ringgit for uh, hospital equipment beds uh, oxygen concentrators masks and all sorts of things to help the frontliners and so i think you can see how the energy of the youth can be harnessed to really make a positive difference to to communities and it's very important that authority and people like us on this panel and um authority empowers these um uh aspects of social media um highlights these examples so that those who want to be toxic and negative and be keyboard warriors uh do not win uh so that's one uh that's what i would say about social media and of course that has a very strong connection to the reforms that have been uh that have been pursued when you talk about undi 18 when you talk about uh parliamentary reform or political financing um these are all issues which have been continually prominent because of uh social media 
uh, working together, of course, with civil society and making sure that these things are in uh, on, on the media. So it's always in the minds of the citizens and they continually uh, push that. And it's, it's uh, you know, it is a fact that, you know, a lot of the manifesto um, commitments that were made in the last general election, not just on one side, but on both sides and also both sides moving forward. They, these things are in the manifestos because these are things which have been pushed by civil society, which are present uh, on social media. And of course, once you have those things, that's where you have the opportunities uh, for young uh, leadership um, and to come full circle. Of course, one of Tunku Abdul Rahman's greatest laments when he was uh, long before he, after he was prime minister and shortly before he passed away, was that the cabinet is too big and too old. When he was prime minister, um, apart from him, um, the, the ministers, the federal ministers were, were, all relatively, were all relatively young. So I think coming from the first secretary general of the OIC, that's a nice way to come uh, full circle. Thanks. Thank you. Um... Again, to the floor, if there's any questions, uh, please just introduce yourself, give your name and your how to organization and ask away your questions. Anyone? Okay, perhaps I'll, if, if there is still no question, perhaps it will be the last question you're gonna do for me. Then to tie back to the to the whole topic of geopolitics, um, most uh, with with the current situation and particularly during COVID, and the whole uh, the the how COVID has exact, um, exacerbated inequity, and in, in the vaccination itself, there is a great level of inequity between the haves and have not between the global south and uh, um, and the uh, house within the global south. So. There's always been a talk about governments have not exactly been able to really represent or really push um, forward uh, the of the interests of uh, the Muslim population because quite a number of Muslim countries are unfortunately come under the caveat of autocratic or in some even some other cases. So then the the whole will falls under civil society. So where has the voices of the Muslim civil society at a global level? And as well as at a regional level, or even in later, when it comes to key policy issues that are very um, pertinent today, what we um, civil Muslim civil societies are fantastic when it comes to charity, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, addressing uh, basic needs. But what about policy? Policies such as COVID um, inequity, vaccine inequity, global vaccine inequity, um, and of course something very personal uh, to me, um, humanitarian issues such as the refugee, the Muslim refugee crisis. Majority of refugees are from Muslim countries, yet the policies and the voices from the Muslim world is somehow lacking. So um, if the panelists can address it. So maybe give your ideas on where's the role of civil, Muslim civil society in pushing uh, these issues. Um, I'll just go to the same order, Dr. Aizam. Okay, I would briefly I mean, comment on your questions. I think uh, at the moment we have what we call the notion of the Muslim Ummah. And what we have is a theological, uh, if I can say, uh, connections. But we thought is uh, the Ummah means the Muslim Ummah. But we have a very loose, uh, if I can say, uh, ties in that sense. So, yes, we have OIC in the first place. Uh, perhaps to tackle all of this of these issues that you have raised and yet we have problems uh, examples are very easy uh, and then and I mean that you can see it in Malaysia uh, it takes uh, I mean quite late for us to have this vaccination I mean towards the end I think we can see there's a uh, light at the end of the tunnel and I think by by end of this year perhaps I think we will have more than 90 percent uh, of the population, be it uh, the citizens of Malaysia or we have these uh, foreigners or illegal uh, immigrants whatsoever 
uh, this uh, vaccination uh, mean will fully uh, taking place. I have one thing that I would like to share, if I may say this, is the Muslim Ummah should go beyond of what we are having right now. It means that we have been compartmentalized, segregated by countries. We have Malaysia, Turkey, Indonesia, being in Southeast Asia, for example, or being in this or IC, we have a, a loose uh, coordination or ties, if I may say. It reminds me to Professor Takahashi's idea of having this new Muslim Ummah where it should be united, borderless, helping each other. And with regard to this COVID-19 and these uh, vaccines, it should be championed by this uh, notion. Yet, the problem that we, we, but we might see is some of the Muslim countries, they are rich, but relatively the others are poor. And this is something that we have to go back to the teaching of Islam that is uh, helping each other under the Surah Al-As. And that would be something that we should uh, take lead so that if we have the refugee issues, for example, as you mentioned, uh, many of these refugees are from Muslim countries. If we want to follow exactly the EU policy, where citizenships, where EU, uh, I mean, the, I mean, I mean, the, if I may say EU, within the EU countries, they can travel within EU country without restriction. Of course, there are some restrictions with regard to voting, etc. Why does not this notion of Muslim Ummah, uh, having taken this example of EU, shape this new Muslim order, be it uh, under the umbrella of OIC, if we think that OIC, uh, I mean, OIC means there's no, there's no such development that can take place. So we move to other platforms. And I think Turkey, Indonesia, Malaysia can lead this. But it will take some time. But I think the, the stance that Dr. Mahade uh, has initiated with this KL Summit, with the insertion of this few if I can say leaders in Muslim countries, I can see that we would, uh, I mean, uh, have this materialized uh, perhaps in the next 10, 20 years. That's my comment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Harry? Yeah, um, I just want to um, extend from where uh, Dr. Azam was mentioning just now. And again, you know, um, this whole notion of Ummah, uh, I hope that we can do a conference on this very soon. Uh, we need to rethink this whole notion of an ummah. The traditional notion of what an ummah is, is the Muslim world. Uh, but when we look back at the Sahifa, uh, Medina, and the practices of Rasulullah SAW, and also Hamka spoke about this in his Tafsir Al-Azhar, there is this notion of ummah al-wahida, ummatan wahida where we see ourselves as part and parcel of the larger ummah of mankind. And this is where, when we deal with crises like this, uh, with the COVID pandemic, we shouldn't depend on the ummatan, uh, uh, ummah al-Muslimin, al-Muslimun to, to help us. We should actually expand this whole notion of an ummah to include the non-Muslims as well. And this is very, very difficult when it comes to uh, Muslims all over the world. They cannot accept this notion because they think that oh, at the end of the day, Muslims uh, should be helping one another and things will be better when we do that. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen so easily when we can expand this whole idea to include even the non-Muslims and pass, as part and parcel of our common universal brotherhood. I think we can resolve a lot of issues not only in the larger Muslim world, but especially so, and I'm sorry to say this, this is where my Penang hat comes back in, because family is still in Penang. Uh, even in Malaysia, uh, a lot of the issues in Malaysia, as Tunku was mentioning just now, if you look at it, the Ummah from within, it's more fractious than the Ummah from without. Um, we need to work together. 
with as many people from outside our community and to ensure that the problems of our ummah so called the, the muslim ummah is also owned by the people who are non muslims as well and and i'm sure a lot of non muslims out there i mean look at the issues in palestine for example a lot of the ngos from all over the world especially in sweden in the nordic countries they are bearing weighing in helping out greenpeace for example i mean they are going there helping uh, so many parts of the muslim world in crisis when the muslim world cannot help itself so are we going to depend on our own kind i i'm i'm not a skeptic but i'm not going to look that way first and this is where we need to have more conversations on this we need to make more muslim intellectuals especially and educators aware and civil society movements to know that we cannot be asking each we cannot ask the community with the least resources to help the community with no resources we need to ask the global community that have a lot of resources to help the community with a lot of crises and then we can come out from the problems that we see out there thank you thank you and okay over to you uh just to come back to your initial question about vaccines and refugee issue i think on vaccines on the, i mean on the one hand we have to accept that governments will always have a special responsibility to their own citizens first right but i think it was a real opportunity that was missed not only amongst the uh, oic countries but also um asean right to do more to coordinate efforts to to uh to acquire and distribute and administer the vaccines that's all i'll say on that it's a missed opportunity to show that these that oic or, or asean um actually uh, can do something useful uh in terms of the vaccinations for their citizens not just from a national perspective on refugees i mean i touched on it just now um i just reiterate you know this this contradiction or hypocrisy if you will of politicians who say we must protect our muslim brothers and sisters but then when it comes to policy they're not doing anything to actually help those who are here and of course uh, at ideas academy which was jointly set up by ideas and also at yaya san chao kid where i'm a trustee and i know you will be hearing from dr tini later this afternoon i mean we have people children who have been fleeing who have fled uh, persecution in their own countries and yet it is very disconcerting when we hear um leaders political leaders say we must do all our, all we can okay well look civil society voluntary organization are already doing what we can where is the help where is the policy uh change from the government that will ensure that we can do more and i think it is extremely this is this is actually low hanging fruit it should have been done years and years ago and i think it is an indictment on uh muslim countries around the world when muslims from impoverished devastated war torn conflict ridden countries would rather move to the west than move to other muslim countries and i will end there thank you very much yes i think um that being the last question and we are now going to wrap up our session we have gone for 15 minutes of a time and eating up your lunch and prayer time um please um um th- let's thank the panelists for a very interesting session um to the organizers for organizing this and i think what the the outcome of at least this have actually a lot of things still need to be unpacked a lot of things need to be still need to be discussed um and and one thing for sure is i think um that all three speakers did really push forward is that uh, muslims really need to start thinking not just looking but also thinking outside of their own comfort zone and bubble we are part of humanity we are part and our role is not just for ourselves but is towards the greater uh, is the towards the greater human race as a whole so um with that uh we end our session i just got to say a few things um from the organizers please come back um at 2 pm for the uh for the continuation of the afternoon session this are all being recorded so you can if you tune in to the recording it will be on normally as fb page and what tv fb page so 
again, thank you everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa Have a good afternoon and enjoy the um, rest of the conference. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Anta. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.